Welcome to All Write in Sin City, a podcast about writers and writing in the Windsor, Detroit region. Your podcasters today are Sarah Jarvis, former bookseller, publishing rep, and literary festival chair, Kim Conklin, Windsor based writer and filmmaker, and me, Irene Moore Davis, author, educator, and local historian. This week's podcast was recorded at BookFest Windsor 2019. Today we'll talk with Ben O'Neill and Jessica Bromley Bartram. Both authors are with Pop Noir, a publisher of graphic novels based in Toronto. Together they led an awesome workshop on graphic storytelling, and then they stopped by to talk about their own personal work. Now, let's hear from Ben and Jessica. Ben, could you give us just a little bit of your background? Um, yeah, my I guess my background's a little bit all over the place. Like I went to OCAD uh, for art criticism and curatorial practice. Um, I was also doing abstract painting at the time. Ended up falling into illustration and comics, uh, one way or another, and uh, have also dabbled in screenwriting a little bit as well. I read that you had a film that played at Khan. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of people jealous of that. Yes, it's, it's a little bit convoluted. We we were um, showcased by Telefilm um, in a part of the festival. We didn't get like an official screening, but uh, we did get invited to to Khan, and, and we went. So still a big deal, yeah. but I always need to like downplay it a little bit. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, it was great. Kim is our resident screenwriter, so uh, oh, she's amazing. very she's so very I'm, geeked I'm out right way now. Geeked out. Yeah. 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 So, Total fangirl. Uh, and Jessica, can you do the same? Uh, yeah, I also have a sort of con is convoluted again, but a very sort of winding path to where I am now. I uh, graduated from high school in 2003 and went to Guelph for English and history. I thought I was going to be a journalist or an editor or something, and then thankfully realized it wasn't for me and didn't go in that direction because I don't have the like fortitude especially for journalism, especially the way it's gone in terms of... Anyways, yeah, that's mm-hmm. a whole other issue. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so then I ended up working for four years with nonprofit organizations, doing communications development kind of stuff, so related to my English degree, I guess. Um, and then after at the end of those four years, I, start, I was doing picking up little graphic design jobs for the nonprofits I was working with and realized that that's what I actually wanted to be doing. And so I initially, I went, I went back to school in... 2011 to OCAD for um, graphic design and ended up picking up a lot of illustration while I was there. Like I I took almost an entire minor in illustration. It just isn't on my degree. Uh, Yeah. So then I went, so I went back to school for a second BA. And when I graduated from that, uh, I sort of started freelancing and I've been freelancing since 2015, officially sort of doing what I do. So I do graphic design for mostly nonprofits, which is wonderful because you can make I, I sort of I do graphic design and illustration for them, which is nice because a lot of so they only have to work with one person for both things. Um, and also I get to work with all these people who are saving the world <laughs> or working on it. Um, and then I also illustrate for children's books. Thus far, I've done two kids books, both for different like two different authors. So working with other people's words, and then I do my own work where I write and illustrate my own pieces, which are more sort of sort of, sort of like grown up picture books because they're more sort of picture book style in terms of the way the text and the images interact, but um, they're not for, I'd say, 12 and up (laughs) would be the safe. Like, I would have liked them when I was younger, but it depends on the kid. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like you always wanted to be a storyteller because you went into, Mm -hmm. you were thinking about journalism or or anything, so that's always been in your background, and did you ever have a um, an artistic approach to it? Yes, uh, my parents are both artists, so, uh, so yeah, so I actually grew up um, my dad always did the thing where it was like, you know, he encouraged me in my art, but was also like, you should also be a teacher or like, you know, do something else because art is really hard, like a very realistic perspective on it. Um, and so I always did art and that kind of fell to the wayside when I was like, well, cause I was focusing on writing. Uh, and then, um, I think I mentioned this in the workshop I did, but I, I broke my ankle in 2007 and that's when I picked art back up because I was I had watched a million movies, I had read all the books, and I wasn't writing stories at the time. So I just sort of started painting these weird little watercolors of animals in Victorian clothing. And then they <laughs> came with stories, like just stories kind of bubbled up. Like there was just like a very long caption on each one. And then that kind of morphed and turned into, I got back into writing more narrative stories again, like continuous narrative stories, and then started doing what I do now, 
with the yeah with my book, which I'm sure we'll talk about. That that, that is a winding path. <laughs> yes, yeah, okay. very winding. Yeah, I just. <laughs> but yeah, so I so I, I grew up doing art and writing story like very in a very creative household where that was very encouraged. What so kind you, of what kind of Victorian animals appealed to you most, and why? <laughs> well, it was more the animals were all kinds of animals. It was more yeah. So I, I went through a phase where I was fascinated with Victorian era, but in a way where I also you know knew that they it wasn't like it wasn't romanticizing it. Act. I think my, sort of part of my way of sort of trying to get away from romanticizing it because you know there was some really terrible, well, more yeah, many terrible things happening at the time in terms of colonialism and all that fun stuff. Um, but it was sort of I, I but I liked the aesthetics of it. I think that was my way of taking it away from from like not being romanticizing directly the humans of. But I like I loved the clothing and I wanted it was basically sort of fashion portraits but with animals instead of people, which like is is everyone has done like not everyone, but it's a very common thing on the internet is like animals in like anthropomorphized animals in people clothing. Mm -hmm. And I've seen a lot of other Victorian style ones. And that's not the only reason I moved away from it. Like I also just sort of naturally developed. But that was sort of like I really like doing my own thing. Not in sort of a, you know, I can't do that because someone else has done it. Because that everyone has done everything and, you know. Um, But it was kind of, I wanted to move away and do something a little more myself. Like, Mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. It was a place to begin. Yeah, it was a good place to start. And it sort of got me started with balancing images and writing. And then when I went to OCAD, I sort of learned how to more effectively start combining those. And my, my final thesis at OCAD was actually basically a narrative... I cre- I sort of said like a dystopian narrative that was presented as sort of an exhibition about like that's happened after an apoc- a sort of a weird apocalypse. I won't get into it. I could go on for ages about that. Um, but yes, but it's sort of I ended up my thesis was surrounding it a narrative, and then I created all these visuals and an exhibit catalog and all these like a, a stop motion sort of explanation of what happened and stuff. And it was this very multidisciplinary. And I ended up winning the graphic design medal for it, which I was not expecting because it wasn't clean. It wasn't sort of, it wasn't, I expected someone who had more sort of hard graphic design to win because it was a graphic design medal, but they ended up giving it to my weird interdisciplinary, like I had textile sculptures. It was very weird. Um, but yeah, so I guess they, I don't know, appreciated the narrative portion of it. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, so, okay, let's talk a little bit about your books. Um, ben, can you tell us a little bit about the top, the subject matter of your book and the style? Yeah, um, yeah so Apologetica is a collection of uh, six short comics um, that all sort of respond to similar themes in different ways. Um, so I was really interested in the idea of uh, guilt and martyrdom, especially in relation to um, the human relationship with the natural environment and um, sort of the rituals and manifestos um, that we use to ground ourselves morally um, in the midst of all the damage that we're doing to each other and the planet. <laughs> it's pretty uplifting stuff. I was going to say, yeah. well, that's, that is an unusual topic for a graphic novel. That's, yeah, how did that come yeah. to you? Um, I think it was... It was a way of sort of channeling a lot of the cyclical thoughts um, that I'd been having for the past uh, year or so um, and sort of uh, approaching these very like cynical, pessimistic subjects um, with sort of like an absurd sense of humor. And I think cartoons and comics have a lot of uh, potential to, to do that because it's such like a a a poppy you know a lot of people think about it in terms of like kids comics or something that's geared more towards young people um and there's like a very disarming um disarming quality to them that i think can actually be used to open the door to more serious topics yes that's true and if you think about even some of the most popular long-running series there's some real dark sides in there that are explored there is something i perhaps about the way the design of it or the the color and the and the images it it gives you a little bit of space to sort of process the story information without it you know absolutely overwhelming you yeah 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 and it you know it's it's an opportunity to maybe talk about um like academic things or or uh, theory that is not intimidating or like doesn't seem stuffy to people in the same way that you know a thesis dissertation might 
Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, that, that, was, that was my approach to it. Mm-hmm. So um, why do you think that might be important for readers to take a look at these stories? Um, I mean, I think it's sort of an opportunity to <laughs> like laugh at some of our problems while um, you know, remaining mindful of them. Um, The book certainly doesn't present any clear answers to the problems um, it describes, but, um, you know, I I think it's an opportunity for um, a pretty diverse demographic of of people to sort of meditate on the same (laughs) existential crises that that we're all going through, Um, yeah, in, in an approachable and humorous way. Yeah. Excellent. Going into that project, did you have a sense of the exact themes you wanted to address, or did that emerge as part of the writing? Yeah, I think really it it started with the themes. Like, I think I had a couple very rough ideas for, yeah, one or two of the stories, um, but I knew the topics that I was interested in, and I liked the idea of the book being sort of variations on a theme. Um, So, you know, always coming back to the same central place, but starting off in very different places and and returning to the center. It sounds almost musical the way you've organized it. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, totally. Um, I I have a bit of a musical background as well. I I studied uh, piano as a a kid and teenager. So I think, yeah, the way that I talk about art um, in, in a lot of different mediums, I think, comes back to musical structure in, in a way. Interesting. Okay. What was your biggest challenge when you were writing this book? Um, probably, I mean, it's a big part of it, but probably the drawing. Like, I, I think I wanted things to be very clean, um, but I have a very chaotic style as well. Like, I, I really want I always sort of like fill the space, like every available space on the page um, and trying to, you know, find a focus point within that or like, um, like in in the talk I was giving, I I talked a lot about um, this idea of like the visual language of panic and how that really lends itself well to the story. So, you know, striking that balance where I wanted the book to be chaotic and like visually repulsive in a way but also in a way that you know people were brought into it and there was a little bit of a visual focal point here and there uh, it was a hard balance to strike can you describe the visual language of panic a little bit i think that's a really interesting idea um yeah so it was it was something it was a style that i borrowed from certain artists um, like Howard Finster or William Kerlach or William Blaney um, where it's you get the feeling that there's this very intense message like they were all very like they were basically religious zealots who thought the world was ending Um, so you know obviously there was a very tangible desperation in how they composed um, their images you know they filled like every available space on the canvas um so yeah there's there's just this very human intensity to their work where um they don't want to leave any space untapped to communicate their message um which is obviously like pretty intense to look at um and i wanted to yeah take that and and borrow it and a humorous way but also sort of in a genuine way because a lot of the topics I'm talking about are pretty pressing and desperate. So given that this is pretty heavy subject matter you were dealing with, what would you say was the most enjoyable part about writing the book? What did you have the most fun doing? Um, I really love working with color um, I, and I think color, the, the colors in the book are maybe the most inviting. <laughs> and fun aspect to it maybe the only fun and inviting aspect to it um yeah so I think when I had the most fun was when sort of the pencils and inks were laid out and I knew generally uh, how the text was going to read and from there could just sort of lay in the colors and and uh, have fun moving moving things around 
Okay, so yeah, so taking it from the dark outlines and sketches and yeah. then adding color to the world. That's yeah. kind of cool. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, and, yeah, Blair, what are you working on? Um, sorry, Blair. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica, what are you working on now? Um, in, in terms of Books. afterwards? Or? Yeah, your next project, yeah. Uh, so I am working on a follow-up to Ghost Water Kiss, which um, Mark was describing a bit in the uh, presentation um, that I'm working on. This is going to be my first time doing a longer single story. Because, um, the, yeah, the interesting thing sort of um, is a very different process from Ben's because I had four of the stories that are in the book are basically reproduced exactly from little books that I self-published, sort of chapbook, zine style kind of things. Like, um, so it was a very different. It was more of a sort of a collecting experience. So I had four stories that were basically copied directly into the book as I had printed and painted them. Um, and then two or three, three stories that I had, I had the writing and I had done something visual for them, but then expanded it for the book um, and do it because some of them had been in different mediums and stuff. So I, and I wanted the mediums to be the same throughout the book, which is watercolor and gouache. And then one story that I wrote for the book, especially to be like, sort of, this is the brand new one. It's never been out in any form. You've never seen it before. <laughs> um, and that was interesting because that was my first experience sitting down and writing on purpose. Uh, my previous stories, it kind of, I didn't have a writing process before. I, you know, wrote seven stories without a process. <laughs> they're all very short and very, sort of they're very stream of consciousness and they're very focused on imagery. Um, even the writing, like the images are <laughs> images, but the, the writing is also very focused. It's very sort of Im impressionistic writing and it very much, it requires, the, the pictures and the writing, even though it's sort of more of a typical, like laid out like a short story and it's sort of the blocks of text, not sort of as comic it's not integrated like a graphic novel but it is very much the writing and the text and the writing and the images support each other okay. just like in in much in the way it, in a kid's book the mm -hmm. writing and the images support each other um and you use yeah. watercolor why, why that choice um i do i sort of when i started with those victorian animals i started i just had watercolors so that's what i started with um and then i when i was at ocad i took an illustration class and ended up, and I, I sort of used to use like layers and layers of watercolors and would make them, try to make them thicker and very vibrant. And my prof for that class was sort of asked me, like, have you heard of gouache? <laughs> Which is basically sort of, it's not, cause I, I didn't like acrylic paint because it's very thick and shiny and I didn't like the effect of it once it was dry. But gouache is kind of in between. It's got more of, you can put it on thickly and opaquely, but it dries matte like watercolor does. It doesn't have any shine to it. Okay. And that sort of changed the way I worked. So I used to just do watercolor and would just sort of do layer upon layer upon layer, and it was ridiculous. But now f I, I do watercolor washes, like sort of for the delicacy of washes and skies and various things. And then I do gouache on top, which allows me to put in the detail because I do sort of teeny tiny details. And it allows me to work in a much more sensible way. Um, and also just sort of lets me, it works for my process because before I didn't have very many highlights in my work because I didn't retain them when I was doing the washes and then but now I can do white or lighter colors on top so yeah so it's sort of it yeah it's sort of my style has definitely evolved mm -hmm. from when I started with the first story that I wrote which was frostbitten um that was all watercolor and I, I literally cannot replicate that style I had to do a replacement image for that story because there was one it didn't it wouldn't fit in the book properly and I I had to sort of do my best to sort of make it fit in because I can't paint that way anymore Mm -hmm. I don't know how to do it, which is so funny. It's sort of like my that this past past art me is a stranger. Yeah. <laughs> sort of like I don't know who that is. Yeah. So yeah, it's an interesting experience when you realize how much because it's been I I did Frostbit in six years ago, so it's been a six year process. So sort of the four stories in the book were done between 2013 and 2017. The four that I produced on my own that then got incorporated in collection, and then between sort of late 2017 to January um, of this year <laughs> was when I was doing the other four stories, basically. Mm -hmm. So it's a very interesting process because you've got those four that sometimes they're hard for me to look at because the art is different. Like I, I sort of look at it and go, oh, I could have done that. Like, you know, that composite, I, you know, it's, it, that's at least for my art brain, that's how it works. Like I sort of, I, even my kid's book, my first kid's book that I did in 2018, people seem to like it. And I'm not saying the art is bad, but like I have trouble looking at it now. Because I make, I would have made different choices. I think that's common. Yeah, yeah. and Everybody I think that's common that. with that's writing weird. and art. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, but that's sort of a constant sort of. But I sort of force myself to look at them because that helps me think about for the next project how I want to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So, yes. So, yeah. Let, let's talk a little bit about your next projects or what you're working on now. What, what are, what's the current thing? Um, yeah. So I've been working on a tarot deck uh, for the past <laughs> nine months, on and off. Um, it really just started out as I, I made a few as like a Christmas present uh, for my girlfriend and roommates, and realized I had a lot of fun. Um, sort of exploring the symbolism um, in the cards while, um, you know, making them unique uh, to w with my style. Um, yeah, I had, I had originally only planned to do the Major Arcana, which is 22 cards in the 78 card deck, and finish the 22 and sort of thought, well, I might as well finish it now. Um, <laughs> so now I've got my work cut out for me. I'm about halfway through. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm I'm aiming to have that done sometime next year, and then I'm also planning on uh, using the cards to make a Choose Your Own Adventure book. Oh, um, how cool Where you be? navigate your way through the deck in, in different ways. Um, so that's the next that's the next big thing. Yeah, okay. working away. Great. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I think I, I started mentioning and then got sidetracked because I speak in tangents. Um, <laughs> that's how I speak. Uh, but yeah, so I am working on the follow up to Ghostwater Kiss, and it's a single story and sort of carrying on from what I was saying about the last story in the book, the one that I did brand new for the book, which was my first time sitting down and writing on purpose. I kind of sat down. and was like, I need to make a story. And because previous ones I sort of had an idea and sort of gradually it sort of fell out of my head in a very not purposeful way. But this is my first time sitting down going, I have to write a story, have to find an idea, have to write it out. You know, I have two weeks. Um, and so this carrying on from that, the new story I'm working on um, is going to be one single story. Um, it's going to be sort of novella length is what I'm aiming for. So like 10, I'm just over 10,000 words right now and I might... I don't know if it's going to get bigger, smaller from there, but novella length. And it is my first time feeling like a writer. Because before, sort of writing was incidental. Like, sort of the writing, I did the writing so I could make the pictures, kind of. Mm -hmm. Like, I enjoyed the writing, sort of. Writing is very painful to me, but I, I enjoy it, in, but it hurts. Um, but, yeah. I think so, it's common, too. Yeah. <laughs> based, based on Twitter, that's very I follow a lot of writers on Twitter. That's very common. Um, but, yeah, but this was my first time feeling like a writer because I would go, okay, you know, the next between, you know, when I finish my coffee and noon, it's time to go out to the porch and write. Like mm -hmm. I'm going to do like a solid three hours. I have like, it doesn't matter how many words I write in that time. Um, and, but I'm going to sit down and write, which is my first time really doing that in a longer, in a larger sense. Cause the other story I wrote was, you know, 3,600 words. So it took me two weeks, but, but it was sort of, it wasn't as, I didn't, it was a very simple plot, whereas this has an actual plot arc and has all these sort of intersecting voices in it and stuff, and it's my first time sort of doing dialogue, because I tend to avoid that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's sort of dialogue, it's not full conversational dialogue. But yeah, so it's a very interesting experience, and I haven't even started the pictures yet, but it's been a very interesting experience sort of feeling like a writer for the first time and like relating to all those tweets, both joyful and frustrated that I've read from other writers that I follow and going, oh, I suddenly get it. Like I get that sort of feeling where you sit down and like, you know, come out of your fugue state and you're like, I've written 2000 words, which I'd never done before. Like it used to be that each word was like a painful, mm -hmm. like unless I had a moment of sort of, oh, got to get it down. Uh, sewing all my little bits together was such a like, horrible Frankenstein process of like, oh, <laughs> pull a word out. Oh, it was just terrible. Um, whereas this process, and it wasn't like I, you know, sat down and made an outline or stuff. It wasn't as organized as it can be, but it was just sort of, I found space for writing in a way I never had before. And now I'm really excited. Like, on the train home, my nine hour train ride home to Ottawa, I'm going to be doing my first sort of edit. I've, I, put, I haven't looked at it in a few months. So this is going to be my first time going back and sort of editing and adding and taking away before I send it to some people to read it and make sure it, you know, works. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, so it's, it's my first time feeling like a writer and it's very exciting. Cool. And yeah. I see another benefit to literary festivals is that the writing time while you're stuck traveling <laughs> to and from. <laughs> it's great. Great. That's excellent. I'm, I'm so, I'm just collecting all of these benefits of literary yeah. festivals. So <laughs> I'll blurb it for you. I'm in. Because I love the train. The train is the best way to get work done for me. I'm so focused on the train. It's Totally agree. Totally not. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Agree. So, so what what was it like giving the workshop this morning? Did you enjoy it? Was it? Yeah. 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 It was. It was great. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed the Q and A section at the end. Um, 
Yeah, I, I think like we've both sort of given talks or I don't know if I would call it a lecture, but may, maybe like talks at um, other launches and stuff. But this one seemed like a lot more engaged with, mm -hmm. uh, with the audience. So I really yeah. enjoyed that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And this was kind of my first time because we did a launch in Toronto at the Beguiling. And but that I didn't sort of think about talking about my work. I was just like, it's a reading. I'm going to do a reading. <laughs> and then I happened to talk about stuff, you know, sort of like, like introducing a song at a concert. I was sort of like, this story came from here. Um, but this was my first time since I had to, it's like at school, you know, they make you do praises and they make you think about what you're doing. And it's wonderful. And I love that part because I came from an English background, so I could do that. Like, it was easy for me. It was great. Um, but this was my first time doing that, turning that on my own personal work. Mm. <laughs> and um, so my partner, Ian, he, his dad is, is, is like, his job is basically giving speeches about IT market research, so different speeches, but, um, and he has, he sort of channeled his dad to help me build the talk in a way that would be interesting, because I don't, I've never done sort of a more this kind of talk where it's, I did reading bits, but I was sort of lecturing, like talking about my work, and he helped me sort of find a narrative arc, and it was really neat, because I'd never done that before, I was like, I don't know, I'm just going to talk about how I draw stuff, I'm like, I'm like, all right, and he was like, no, no, you need like a story, I was like, oh, I guess so. <laughs> So yeah, so, so it was like much like writing this new story is this was also a new experience for me having to really in-depth think because unlike Ben's work, I don't really, my stories don't really talk about issues or like my stories are sort of weird little snapshots inspired by the natural world and sort of weird transformations and stuff. They're more sort of, yeah, stream of consciousnessy weird fiction. So it's harder for me to to talk about sort of like I don't have sort of like I'm talking about this issue and stuff so it's, it was a new experience sort of being like what can I talk about okay. besides I do sketches <laughs> so it helped you clarify yeah so it, was, it actually made me think differently about my work which was always wonderful mm -hmm. <laughs> well Thank you so much for joining us today, and we're so glad you came to BookFest. Yeah, thanks really for having us. We really appreciate your time. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thanks. thanks for joining us. Look for more episodes of All Right in Sin City wherever you listen to podcasts, or check out our website, allrightinsincity.com. For information and announcements of new podcasts, sign up to our email list or follow us on Facebook and Twitter.